Set Phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. Happy Friday to you as well. How goes it? You know what? Friday nights are for a partying. And this is a party <laughs> you and I and whoever's watching have. <laughs> so it's a very small party. <laughs> it's a small, though, though it be Intimate. small, it is, it is fierce. Mm. Uh, it, is a, it is a vicious party. Okay, well, welcome to Set Phasers, mm -hmm. a highly illogical Star Trek podcast of a, of a Friday night. Today's star date is, of course, star date 21002.8. And we will be discussing Star Trek Discovery, Season 2, Episodes 9 and 10. We're getting near and the end. Wowzers. We're getting near the end, and things are getting, they're getting kind of hectic. I don't mind telling you. Uh, so... I don't. Yeah, it, yeah. I uh, I can't whistle. I can whistle sort of, but I can't do that. So I won't even try. Woo is what I'll say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's run it down. <laughs> it's time to run it down. Can you run it down for me? What just happened? Can you run it down for me? Who doesn't love a good rundown? Well, this is season two, episode nine, Project Daedalus, which is a mystery. Uh, I was tempted to Google it before uh, even watching the episode, but I decided not to. And I'm so glad that I waited. Isn't Daedalus the father of Icarus, who puts on his wings with the honey and flies too close to the sun? That might be right. I didn't Google it. Oh, should all we? Right. Should we? You know what? Let's. Let's should we should, let's, Google let's, it. let's Google it. If you want to, you can Google that. There we go. Yeah. Minotaur or Minotaur? Uh depends where you're from. I've heard it both ways. I say Minotaur. Where the Minotaur a half man, half bull creature dwelt. So there we are. I was yeah. kind of right. I just didn't realize he had his own story. I just assumed he was yeah. father of Icarus. Father of Icarus. He made the wings. Flew too close to the sun. But let's not uh, let's not dwell on that. I'm okay. sure there's no there's no heavy symbolism in that. Uh, let's begin by saying, hey, this episode is directed by everyone's favorite number one, Jonathan Frakes. Yeah. So you know you're in for a real trip. So uh, you may remember last time uh, they they basically they had to go and they found Spock and and then Michael and Spock went to sex and then they had to run away and then there was a whole chase uh, and then they went to the planet with the aliens with the big heads and they you know there was all Section Thirty One showed up as a standoff between Section Thirty One and and Discovery Pike versus Leland and then they fooled them with another you know like a basically an illusion and then they were like what should we do now and spock said with my limited uh knowledge as a as a refugee what is it limited knowledge as oh as a i want to say vigilante that can't be right my limited knowledge as oh a, i forget great can't remember the word for it anyway on the run he says we should run <laughs> <laughs> victim vigilante does it start with a v who knows all right, so we begin with this. A ship drops out of warp. It is a shuttle. This is how the episode begins. We have no idea what ship or shuttle this is. And we see that it is approaching a ship we know as Discovery. We can recognize Discovery sort of is chilling behind a planet. And then we wind up in a shuttle bay on Discovery, and the ship opens up, 
and who should arrive, but Aki's favorite name to try and remember how to say, Admiral Cornwell. <laughs> did I write it in red Sharpie? Yes, I did. Uh, she's there incognito because we know that uh, Discovery is on the run. She's meeting with them in secret and she immediately comes off the shuttle and says, I want to speak to Spock. Where's Spock? And Pike is sort of trying to get her to like, hey, should we talk about the whole uh, Section 31? We don't trust them. They tried to rip Spock's brain apart. She's like, listen, we can deal with that. When we deal with that, I need to talk to Spock. And so she goes and she, I guess she sets up like a kind of futuristic lie detector brain scan technology for Spock. And she basically questions him about the killings. And she wants to know what happened, you know, at, at Starbase 5. Did he kill those three people? And Spock says, I didn't. I did a Vulcan nerve pinch. And she says, are you sure you didn't kill them? And then he says, I'm definitely sure. Same time that's happening, uh, Pike and Michael are discussing Tyler. Because you may recall, they sort of have assumed because of their, they've had some leaks, that the leak is Tyler. That Tyler's been leaking to Section 31, and so they've confined him to quarters. However, Michael does not believe that Tyler is the leak. And also, Nota Bene, we know that Tyler is not the leak. But uh, Pike does not feel confident in that. He wants no contact between Michael and Tyler. And he tells Michael to go check on Spock, help him figure out what he needs to figure out about the Red Angel. Uh, And so she goes in and she interrupts the interrogation that Spock is having with Cornwell, and we get some more uh, somewhat cold exchanges between Michael and Spock, who have had a falling out. Uh, But later, uh, Pike, Saru, and Cornwell are discussing the results of that interrogation. Basically, Spock is telling the truth, or at the very least, he believes that he is telling the truth. However, Cornwell shows Pike and Saru uh, the footage of Spock's getting out, escaping the prison. And in it, he basically beats the crap out of three doctors slash, well, I guess one doctor and two security people. And then he picks up a phaser and he kills them, all three of them point blank, and then leaves. Which, no, everyone is like, uh, that doesn't seem like Spock at all. Um, so they're like, do you, can you, maybe this is fake and, and, Cornwell says, no, this is from the source. I checked the source code. This comes directly from Starbase 5. And, you know, there's sort of like a a question as to what's going on here. And that's when Cornwell lets loose a little information. Uh, She hasn't heard from the, like, senior command staff in Section 31 in quite some time. They have not been responding to her messages to speak. She's also been locked out of control. The computer the like threat assessment computer, super computer that control uses to figure out, you know, to, to, to help them come up with their plans for the future of the Federation. And she believes she has been locked out by an adversarial admiral. <laughs> See what I did there? Mm. Adversarial admiral. It's not uh, hard admiral, to say it. It is so easy. Wait till you find out that this admir- adversarial admiral's name is Patar. Uh, Admiral Patar, who is apparently a logic extremist, which which I found confusing actually, because I was like, why? How could you be a logic extremist and an admiral in Starfleet? It seems like those two things would be would sort of not allow you to go one to the other. But in any case, she thinks that Patar is not into it. And after the red signals had first appeared, Patar had lobbied Starfleet Command to simply let. Control take over decision making entirely to not have control be sort of in an advisor role. And so Cornwell's like, I don't know what's going on, but I want Discovery to go to Section 31's forward operating base, their FOB, and arrest Patar and get control of control back to Starfleet. And this is all being done. They're like running dark. This is all covert ops. So um, on the bridge, Right after that meeting, Tilly says that the transmissions of Tyler, whom we assume is the spy, went to a location uh, that sh- uh, she has the coordinates, and the coordinates are 74 Mark 5.6. When she says, having scanned there, there's nothing there, nothing in that location, except a, a penal icon. Oh, I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> nothing there except a penal colony that was abandoned 
over 100 years ago. All right, so there's nothing there except this old penal colony that no one has been using for a century. And Cornwall explains, like, actually, hey, uh, that's not abandoned. That is Section 31 headquarters. And so Pike says, Tilly, start decoding the messages. We want to find out what the messages are. And we are headed to those coordinates because that's where we're going to pick up Pitar. Boom, credit sequence. That was the cold open, folks. Um, when we come back from the cold open, we have a, this is a bracing thing. We're experiencing a memory of a man and a woman and they're talking to a camera and they're basically, they've just gotten engaged and they're going to be telling their family they'll see them soon to celebrate. And we find out this is a memory of Lieutenant Commander Ariams, the, the, the cybernetically enhanced, um, bridge officer. And she's reviewing the memory and she's sort of deleting recent memories from the past week. And she's like, some she keeps, some she doesn't, uh, some she sends into archives. So she seems to be sort of a clearinghouse. And Tilly shows up. Tilly, who was in some of the memories, apparently Tilly and Arium have a very close friendship. And she finds a bottle of sand. And and Arium explains, you know, because in the video, there was like a, a very normal looking human woman. And Arium is essentially made of like steel and plastic and metal and stuff. She explains that that bottle of sand is from the beach from that day that she got engaged and it was the last day that she was with her fiancé as they were coming home. Their shuttle went down and she never finishes the sentence, but I think we all get the picture. He died. Uh, but Tilly is there to ask Arium for some decryption help because she's trying to decrypt those messages. Now, here I'll do a quick flashback to the last episode because, oh, you don't know, oh, you can if you want to go for it. <laughs> When they were trying to pull the shuttle out of the uh, time rift and the weird drone from the future squid drone thing was beating up the shuttle and trying to get information and they broke it off and they tried to get it off the ship. Remember, Arium was the one who like she was looking at the data being coming in and like fighting the thing. And then suddenly she had like a weird flash and her eyes flashed three red dots. And we were like, "Uh oh, SpaghettiO." So we kind of know that, yeah, that's what I said out loud. Um, we know that Arium has been compromised, um, and it's only a matter of time. Right now, everyone thinks it was, it's Tyler, but I think we all think it's it's Arium at this point. We just don't know why. In the meantime, Stamus is working to fix the spore drive, which was also sabotaged. They think by Tyler uh, in the last episode. Stamus is working on the spore drive. Michael and Spock are trying to go through the red angel signals, but uh, they're having a lot of, they're having trouble going through the information because they have not worked out their brother-sister relationship. Uh, and so they are kind of sniping at each other and Stamets is finding it very distracting and he asks them to leave. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Tilly and Arium are working, and Arium, excuse me, are working on the decryption meanwhile on the bridge and they sort of figure out the key and so they set the computer to work on the the encryption and then unbeknownst to anyone arium gets the three red dots in her eyes and she says to tilly oh this might take a little while longer you might as well go do some other stuff and i'll let you know when it's finished dun 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 which we don't need to play because there'll be so many of those <laughs> coming up in the rest of this episode uh okay so they're getting ready to to drop out of warp and to try and storm the gates of Section 31's headquarters. Admiral Cornwell, also written in red ink here, shows them that Section 31 is a heavily fortified position. It is surrounded by a minefield, mines, which are not, not legal in the Federation. And Pike is upset about this, and they have a little, they, they have a little anger about it, but uh, basically Katrina Cornwell says like it was it was unprecedented times when the Klingons were seeming like they were going to destroy the Federation. Um, and uh, so she shows them like the lay of the land. They're going to get through this minefield and then get to Section 31 and then get on there and then capture Patar and then do a hard reset of control and bring the, give the controls back to the rest of the Admiralty. So looks like that's going to be hard. Meanwhile, Michael and Spock... Um, have gone to Michael's room and I call this, you know, we didn't set up, there's a Stamets stingers, but I think Spock gives Michael mm. a little bit of a stinger here. I don't know if you want to hit that. Ooh, that stings. Yeah. 
it works. I like it. Yeah, it's great. It's just a stinger because they enter Michael's room and Tilly has her side of the room and it's beautifully decorated and there's like bespoke uh, covers and sheets and there's pictures and tchotchkes and plants and Michael's side of the room is like standard issue, like <laughs> Federation blanket, nothing special. And Spock says, uh, unlike Ensign Tilly, you seem to have no individual expression whatsoever. It is quite an accomplishment to be uniquely mundane. <laughs> This is, uh, yeah, this is Spock is really, he's really upset at his big sister. Um, Michael says, maybe we should play chess because she thinks it'll help Spock think outside of the box since logic is not working. So recontextualize the situation, but she has to sort of taunt him to get him even to play. And Spock accepts. Um, meanwhile, Arium is on the bridge or no, she's in a lab, just sort of an inexplicable lab. And she is downloading something to herself. She's got her hand in the thing and says downloading and it's got a little progression bar. She's interrupted by, I think, Lieutenant Commander Nan, <clears throat> who was, came over from the Enterprise, who's the head security officer for Pike and is now the head security officer on Disco. And Arium, uh, Nan is sort of like, what's going on? What are you doing here? And Arium's like, oh, I'm just uh, working on some stuff, doing some stuff, whatever. And Arium asked Nan seemingly innocuously about the two breathers that she has. She has two breathers because she is a Barzan and, uh, you know, like uh, oxygen atmosphere apparently is unbreathable for her. So the two breathers allow her to breathe. And er and Nan says, why do you want to know? And Aram says, oh, I was just curious anyway. Better be getting back to the bridge since you said Tilly was looking for me. And so um, she goes to the bridge. On the bridge, Arium's earlier work, you know, the stuff she said, hey, this is going to take a little longer once you get the red dots and send Tilly away. It is no longer working anymore. Tilly's like, I don't know what's going on, but it looks like the computer knew what we were doing and changed its strategy. So we have to redo it. And I don't know. This is interesting. I, I wonder what you think, Steph. Like, did Arium know that something was going on at this point that she couldn't explain? Because she tells, she asked Tilly to stand next to her and not to leave until the work is done. I don't know. I thought it was hard to tell with Arium because there is no expression. I think she, like the way that she would deliver a line could be quite dry, but I thought I wasn't entirely sure. It was just curious to me because you think she's like a sleeper agent, basically. Whenever mm -hmm. the lights go, she does things without knowing, but she seems to have a or that maybe something is going on that she hasn't mentioned to anyone because she does say to Tilly, okay, we're going to start decoding this again and I want you to stand right next to me and don't leave until we finish decoding the whole thing. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. And meanwhile, uh, Nan is very, seems very suspicious of Arium and is sort of watching her uh, from the corner of the bridge. Disco exit warp. D Disco exits warp. Um, they try to hail Section 31. No answers. The mines are armed immediately. Um, but the Admiral apparently has a route through the minefield. Um, but in order to go through the minefield, the shields have to be down. Apparently, the mines are att attracted to the shields. And Pike says, nothing's ever easy, and they go in. Meanwhile, Michael and Spock are playing chess because whatever, right? And Michael's freaked out because it seems she's like, Spock's making all these weird choices. He's not trying to win. He's not following logic. He's just making these moves that seem to, um, he seems like he wants to lose. Meanwhile, they're talking about Sarek. They're, you know, Spock's actual father and Michael's uh, adoptive father. And there's a lot of anger and jealousy about Sarek's, you know, relationship between the, the two of them. And Spock is upset that Michael always seems to take responsibility for everything. She thinks everything's about her. It's her fault. She should fix everything. She's very self-centered. Um, and Spock says she thinks that the extremists were attacking because of her. But in fact, they were attacking because of him, because he was half human. And he thinks that Michael is arrogant. And Michael thinks Spock has to get to confront his anger. And figure out why he's angry. Uh, and it uh, boils up into a rather um, intense confrontation, at the end of which Spock says that he likes he likes feeling emotions for the first time in his life, and he knocks the whole three-dimensional chess set over and storms out. And then Michael's called to the bridge. Why? Because yellow alert! Um, things are jacked up. The mines are coming after Disco, even though the shields are down. Blade mines which apparently are mines that have blades on them, I guess. And they're, yeah, they're just like chewing through the hull. We get, uh, they're being piloted by some someone somewhere somehow because they're like, they're going towards Disco. 
despite the fact that it doesn't have its shields up. And so there's a red alert, and Arium does the light thing, and then she tells Tilly, oh, you can go now, I got it from here, yes. And then Tilly's like, are you sure? You just told me you wanted me to stay. She's like, oh, no, they need you now because of this red alert. And meanwhile, Nan is still watching Arium, and Detmer has to fly through some more mines. There's some mines called blackout mines, which mean all your sensors get all jacked up. So she's like, I think we're upside down and we're going backwards and we're going this way. And Admiral's like, no, that's what the mines are telling you. You just got to fly blind. You're flying in the dark. So Detmer gets this cool moment where she has to fly, you know, and then Michael posits that the mines are being controlled by a computer that, you know, this is like, it is like a game. And so in order to beat the computer, they have to introduce randomness and chaos. And so what they basically, what Pike basically does is has everyone on the crew just suggest any evasive maneuver out completely out of context and has Detmer perform it. And this appears to be working. Meanwhile, Arium has gone from decoding the information to once again, downloading something. And her downloads are like pretty high. It's like 96%. And the mines are smashing into the hull. And, uh, Arium finishes her upload and the mines stop following discovery. Um, however, impulse and warp engines are inoperable, almost as if the mine attacks were very specific to, to disable discovery right next to the Section 31 base. They are then finally hailed by Admiral Patar. And she says that the attack on discovery was not her doing. It was, in fact, an attack... Uh, that was ordered by Starfleet Command because Disco has been engaged in treason, as has Cornwell, apparently, according to Batar. And so Batar says, be prepared to be boarded. Meanwhile, Cornwell says, uh, once that message is over, I know it's more than you bargained for, but basically, it doesn't matter what Batar has just said, or that you're supposed to be arrested, or that they're saying you're committing treason, you need to get a team on that station, and you need to reset control. Pike asks Saru to, to form the landing party, but Saru says, I want to investigate something. And so he gives it to Michael. So Michael is on the is organizing the landing party. Stamets is working in the lab. This is just a cute aside. And the uh, power goes out and they're trying to fix all the engines and stuff so they can get away once power goes out in the lab. They're trying to fix all the engines before the things get finished so they can get away from this uh basically this horror show when things are over. And what could that be? And Spock helps Stamets get the power back online in engineering. And uh, while they talk about that, they also talk about Hugh and Michael. And they both have like a sort of interesting perspectives on each other that I think help each other process what they're both going through. Meanwhile, Michael's uh, decided she's going to have Arium and Nan on her team. She's talking to Detmer and Pike and Arium and Cornwell and the whole thing. It's basically, they're running down the situation on Section 31. There's no air. There's no life support. They got to go in in suits. And then once they get there, uh, Arium is going to go over with the party, and she's going to be the one to reset uh, control. And Nan says she'll go over as well to look after her, quote unquote. Uh, so they go in. Um, they find a bunch of frozen floating blood. Um, Michael says Nan to deal with the life support. She's like, see if we can get the life support going. They go into a big bay and they find four bodies floating in the icy, frigid, gravityless coldness. And actually, while they're walking to find these bodies, Aram gets another boop boop three lights thing. And she pulls out her phaser behind Michael. And it definitely looks like she's about to shoot Michael while she is, well, unawares. But then they find the bodies and and Arium kind of like plays it cool. At this point, I think we know Arium is, she's the one, right? Um, they find out that the victims have been dead for two weeks, according to bioanalysis. And guess who one of the victim is? Hit him with the dun, dun, dun. Why, it's none other than Admiral Patar, the logic extremist. But what? Huh? What? Huh? Uh -huh. huh? What? But she just said, she said to come, you can, we're going to shoot you. You got to, what you, what you going to do? Anyway, back on the bridge, Saru's like, hey, man, that Batar was a hologram, had no shifts or changes in its, like, uh, its, its heat signature when it was upset, when it was angry. And look at this video of Spock. He's here kicking butt. He's breaking down two people and shooting them. He should have expended some energy. No change in his in his heat signature. These are both holograms. These are these are created by none other than hit him with another dun dun dun. 
control. <laughs> now I got a lot. I hope we don't have to pay for that. Uh, just in case we can't use that drop. <laughs> These holograms were created by control. Control is is framing Spock, and now it's using Pitar to lure them in. But whatever for? And while that's happening, Tilly goes back over to Arium Station. She realizes that Arium has offloaded all her memories, and she has uploaded all the information they got from the sphere on... Hit him with a dun dun dun. I don't care. Give him another dun dun dun. I'm having too much fun with his dun 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 stuff. I am. She uploaded all the information from that spear that was 100,000 years old on artificial intelligence. Control is trying to turn itself into an intelligent being. What? The, what? What? Did he, what? 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 So Pike alerts them to the fact that Arium is down there. And as they are figuring that out, Arium basically attacks. And hey, remember, she's basically cybernetic and unstoppable, made out of metal. And uh, so they're having a lot of trouble taking care of her. She rips off Nan's breathers and basically causes Nan to start suffocating on the floor. And then she starts beating the living daylights out of Michael. Now Michael's putting up a good fight. She's got her like Vulcan martial arts to help her, but basically you're hitting a steel wall. So it's not going super great. However, Michael is able to, um, I forget how she does it, like, two foot kick where she falls and then she like uses a phase blast and then kick and another kick. Anyway, she gets Arium into the airlock and she locks Arium in the airlock. Woo. Um, and once they figure all that out and Tilly figures out the AI stuff, they basically realize like Arium is, Arium is trying to give this AI information to control. Control is going to use it to basically take over everything and is going to then yes obliterate all the sentient species in the galaxy which is the horrible vision that spock first saw in his mind meld with the red angel we now have the raison d'etre of season two uh unfortunately arium who Tilly makes a plea to Arium because they're such good friends and she's able to get arium out of her like sleeper state but arium is like listen I hear you and I can talk to you, but I can't control what my body is doing. It wants me to override the door controls. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to kill Michael. I'm going to finish my upload to control. And then I'm going to destroy Discovery. And Pike and Arium and everyone tells Michael that she has to let Arium out of the airlock. She has to reject her out of the airlock. She has to kill her. Michael cannot do it. It is too tough. It is hard. This is hard stuff for Michael and uh, it takes a lot of convincing and Pike orders it. and. At the very last second, Arium says, like, Michael, I'm sorry that this has to be you. I know it's tough, but you got to do it. And she says, oh, by the way, you need to figure out everything you can about Project Daedalus. And then Michael, who still hasn't pressed the eject button, is like, Project, what, what about Project Daedalus? And then Arium goes, ah, and then boop, she gets sucked out of the airlock. And it wasn't Michael. It was Lieutenant Commander Nan making the tough decision. I thought she um, was dead. Or dying. You thought she was dead. Well, yeah, she's there. Yeah, yeah. She's like she's holding like, her uh, breather to her face. She's like, uh, uh, and they just exchange a pretty tough look. And that, well, there's a little bit more to the end. It's Arium floating in space. And uh, Tilly sent her one thing that she had offloaded that last, her favorite memory of uh, announcing, I guess, to her friends and family that they were engaged and they were coming home. And it's the last thing Arium sees before she shuts down completely in the vacuum of space. And that is the end of season two, episode nine, Project Daedalus. Uh, how'd that sound? Pretty good. Does it sound good? Okay. Yeah, All right. It I'll better. take your word for it. Yep. Don't worry about it. Thanks. All right. I appreciate you just kind just of ruffling me. papers uh, sound effect uh-huh. just to, do just to add you it, do to add it this, in. <laughs> to make this work. I don't have flair. I'm just a fellow who likes to take notes. All right. I pour my mid-episode tea. Oh, Good. man. Whew. I'm a wee tea Jenny. You are right? a wee tea Jenny. That's right. She's trying. It's it's not really taking. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> uh, okay. Taking a sip out of my said phaser's, set phaser's mug. mug. Hello. Exclusively. Yes. If you want one, you must contact Steph. Oh, that was great. I'm not going to, that was perfect. You did that great. Thank you. All right. So 
that was a pretty rough episode. If this was like a normal Star Trek franchise, if we were doing 24 episodes a season, I would bet the episode that followed that immediately would be like, uh, hijinks on um, the holodeck or something. However, season two, <laughs> episode 11, is called The Red Angel. So um, it starts with Arium's eulogy. Because Arium died. Tyler is released because they realized he wasn't the traitor. And um, the uh, data from the rest of her memories, which are all that AI stuff, have to be completely deleted. Because now that they've, they've destroyed that and they've destroyed control, none of that information should be there. So control shouldn't have the AI, right? The crew all delivers um, little speeches about Arium and what she meant to them. And Saru finishes up with a song of remembrance for Arium, which is very haunting as her pod is launched out of Discovery and into space, maybe into a sun. I couldn't tell exactly where it was going, but... Mm, just shot out. Yeah, it was a somber conclusion. A somber beginning, in fact, um, to episode 11. Uh, the next shot is Tyler and Michael in the turbo lift, and they have a super awkward conversation where Michael basically is like, I know what you're trying to do, but I still think if you're going to be loyal to Section 31, I don't know how much we can trust each other, period, Right. They go into a conference with the Admiral and all the bridge crew, senior staff, essentially. And they say, okay, here's what we know. The AI is from the far future. It had tech from the sphere. And so they're like, here's what we, we got. We told all, it was hiding in Section 31. So they've told all Section 31 ships to run diagnostics. Apparently they're all clean. But they should still be on the lookout because maybe it was maybe it was able to send itself somewhere before. And it could be dormant somewhere. But in any case, they think they've eliminated all signs of this future AI evil control, right? Tilly shows up and she says that um, some of Arium's system files that they were deleting revealed a file called Project Daedalus. And it apparently shows the whole thing. It's the Red Angel suit and all the tech, and it has some bio-neural signature of, of the person in the Red Angel suit. And guess who it is? Hit me with a dun-dun-dun. It's Michael. Oh, do we have the Michael moment? We should play a little Michael moment. It's Michael, ladies and gentlemen. Michael. Michael moment. You know, we haven't done Michael moments enough. I know. And we it's thought like, we, we thought there would be more. Well, I, there I feel some like. There were Vulcan Volcants. And then there were Vol- a lot of Vulcan Volcans. Yeah. But I feel like she's, well, she's in for a real, guys. It's going to get rough for Michael <laughs> next couple of episodes. Anyway, the bio, the bio neural signature is apparently a match for Michael's. And we go to credits. That was the whole moment. Uh, so Culber, who's not officially reinstated, like uh, being on duty, but who is you know still basically, I guess, the most experienced and highest achieving doctor they have on staff, has been assigned to examine the bio neural signature and compare it against Michael's living signature and make sure that they are, in fact, the same. And they are. He shows, the evidence shows that, like, if someone had just copied it, it would be too perfect. It's it's just imperfect enough to be perfect. And so the, it's definitely, as far as I know, it's Michael in the suit. And so they're like, okay, so what's the deal? Michael, at some point, attains the technology of time travel and undertakes it upon herself to save the whole like universe, which Spock gets in a snide comment. He's like, that's very Michael like, um, but it still doesn't quite explain what the red signs have in common. Why these red signs, why are they going to places and why do they save the crew of the one ship and why do they go to Terra Terra Elysium and do the other thing and like and and to uh Kaminar like why, why all these things so they don't quite know what's going on there as they're sort of puzzling over that in sickbay a section 31 ship shows up and guess who beams on board Leland and uh Georgia um and dun, dun, dun. I, I mean not really I mean sure whatever yeah, I love them. 
it's Leland and Giorgio. Remember Giorgio, who was Michael's captain, but who actually died in this universe. But in the Terran universe, they found the emperor who was Giorgio. And then they brought her back because Michael sort of had a moment, essentially, where she felt like she couldn't leave the Giorgio behind, even though this Giorgio was an irredeemable, tyrannical emperor of a Terran nation that exploited all species except for humans. That Giorgio beams over with Leland. And they're basically like, hey, uh, we know what we need to do about this red angel. We need to set a trap for it. Section 31 has information. Now pay attention here because I have a theory about this. (laughs) Section 31... I don't, maybe it's not a good theory, actually, because I didn't really think it through or research it. But anyway, let's just say what Section 31 says. They have information uh, that 20 years ago, the Klingons were working on time travel. And so they, as Section 31, engaged in their own time travel technology. uh, And Project Daedalus was the response to the, was that, was that project the response to the Klingon time travel thing because they thought a warrior race with time travel that hated humans, they could go back in time and basically stop the human race from existing, period, end of story. Uh, And my aside here is that, is that related to the very confusing plot of the first season and a half of Enterprise with the, the temporal Cold War? There was Klingons involved and also the green guys who could flatten themselves out and shape shift. And anyway, if any nerds out there want to crunch some numbers, it'd be great if you could figure out if that, uh, because the Archer thing I think should be more than 20 years before this, but who knows? Anyway, I don't know. Uh, So Daedalus was a Section 31 project and it was about time travel and it was about to be tested when it was destroyed by Klingon spies. Hmm. Interesting. Mm. Um, and so Section 31 thinks they can set a mouse trap, quote unquote, to get their stolen tech back because they think it is their tech that the Red Angel is wearing. Michael's like, uh, I feel like there's a lot of gaps in that story. Like, doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, what are you not telling us? And Leland's like, eh, I will, I'm not telling you what I don't want to tell you. And the Admiral's like, here's what we need to do. We need Section 31 and we need Discovery to work together to lay this trap for the Red Angel and if we can get all the weird techno jargon stuff to work out, we can we can talk to Michael, future Michael, and figure out what it what is the deal. But we need to figure out how to anticipate where the next red signal will be so we can see the angel, right? Uh, so after the meeting, Giorgio and Michael are walking and talking, and Michael wants to know what Section 31 isn't telling. And Giorgio's like, I can't tell you, but maybe Leland can tell you. Maybe you need to talk to Leland. Uh, and Giorgio has been assigned to go help is, has been assigned to figure out a way to get the red angel to have to stay where they are. And so she's working with Stamets on that. And they're saying that the suit generates a membrane or an anchor through the time wormhole. I don't want to bore you all with the the details. And basically they're going to use some phase disruptors to cause that field to break down so they can hold the red angel in place and then they're going to need a graviton beam from either discovery or leland ship it turns out to be leland ship that is strong enough to collapse the wormhole so collapse the wormhole hold the red angel in place set up a field and then we talk to future michael and we figure she'll tell us what we want to know right that's the plan um in order to power it, they're going to need the equivalent of 12 warp cores, which is sounds awful. But apparently the test site for, one of the test sites at least, for Project Daedalus was a planet called SOF-4. And um, that has like just a ton of duridium everywhere in the atmosphere, in the ground. And that can be the fuel that they need, so they don't need to get all the warp cores. And then... Uh, while they're talking about that and kind of jamming on the tech, in walks Hugh because he thought Admiral Carnwell go. Is that in red ink that time or not? I know I didn't write it in red ink because I didn't. She's not that like, crucial this time. Of course, <laughs> I got it wrong. Hugh walks in because he thought that Ad, uh, Admiral Cornwell was there, and she's not. And then there's tension between Hugh and Paul uh, because you know they had like a weird breakup where yet again um someone knocks something over in a room i would that only happened twice or is that like a third time in season two when someone knocks something over 
angrily and storms out of her room. Uh, well, there's definitely two that I can think of. Right. It happened season, in season last two? episode in Spock, and it Spock, happened, uh, what, two two seasons before that when Q storms out? Anyway, it seemed like they were two into it. Before. Yeah, two episodes before, I think. They were... The writers this season were like, we want people to knock things off of trays or tables and then storm out of rooms. One where did it, which is with the stupid. Where in season one? No, okay, maybe not. I'm making it I don't think you knocked over a whole bowl because he looked at one and then put it down and had that weird thing that made us think that maybe Lorca ain't dead. But whatever. We don't need to (laughs) run down that rabbit hole. Okay. So Hugh comes in, Paul and Hugh, it's awkward. Tilly's there. So that means it's awkward to times Tilly. And then Giorgio is there and she loves awkwardness. And so she basically comes on to Paul. She comes on to Hugh. She sort of comes on to Tilly, calls her red. She gets everyone all hot and bothered. And then she basically leaves. Um, And I don't know, that was a cute moment. (laughs) When she leaves, Tilly basically says, what just happened? (laughs) Uh, Giorgio is just she just likes to have intimate relations with everybody apparently uh, so Nan approaches Michael in the hall and she gives a sort of not quite an apology but sort of a commiseration that it was hard to be the one who hit the button that opened the airlock that killed Arium and Michael says that Nan did the right thing and she was glad that she was there and Nan says that the way that Michael fought so hard for Aria made her glad that Michael was there. And they come to an understanding and they shake hands. It's a beautiful moment. Beautiful moment. Meanwhile, Saru and Leland are working on the whole graviton beam question. Saru has volunteered to work with Leland, but Leland thinks that uh, Pike has set Saru on him to like monitor his activities. And then Saru has another one of his... Uh, aggress uh, uh, like aggro moments where he's like no actually i decided i wanted to watch you to see if you could be trusted and it gets all up in leland's face and he's like i wanted to assess you on my own accord and he says i think you'll do anything to keep us and the crew alive but i still don't think you're telling us entirely the truth uh, in the middle of this like standoff michael arrives and she's like oh i just want to speak to lilo and alone if you don't mind and so was like sure and then the door closes. Michael's like, you got to tell me the deal. I am, or I'm, I don't know. She doesn't threaten anything, but she's like, you need to tell me what the deal is. And, um, okay, well, okay, okay. I don't even know how to go into this. This is so complicated. Okay, I'll just, so Project Daedalus was a project being run by Section 31. Apparently, Leland was affiliated with this. It's not clear whether or not he was running it, but basically he was part of the team running it, right? And uh, he was the reason that Michael's parents and Michael were stationed on Daktari Alpha. Michael says, no, 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 no. We went out there because we wanted to change the scenery. And the only reason we were still there when the Klingons attacked is because I wanted to stick around to see a, a Stargo supernova. I've always blamed myself for my parents' death. Right, she was in the room. She was like hiding in the closet. The Klingons killed her parents. Well, Leland basically says, "I don't know. Is there such thing as a sad dun dun dun?" <laughs> and Leland's like dun 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 dun. dun. Um, <laughs> that here's the thing. Michael's parents were scientists. Michael didn't realize that they were on Doctor Alpha to work on Project Daedalus because it was classified. And even Leland was sort of like disbelieving of the technology until they built the suit. But the suit needed one last crucial piece before it could work. It needed a time crystal, not unlike what uh, Fenton Mudd used last season to torture the crew. And that's good knowledge. Yeah. What can I say? Harcourt Fenton Mudd. HFM. And... uh, so they found out that a time crystal was going on the black market on Kronosh, right? And so Leland led the group that went there and got and stole the time crystal from the Klingons and then brought it back to the Tari Alpha so it could be put in the suit. And then they were going to use the extreme energies of the supernova to test the suit. However, 
Leland did something careless, and the Klingons were able to trace the time crystals theft back to Noctari Alpha, and that's why they attacked, and that is why Michael's parents died. So it was Leland's fault. It was he was careless. And even as he's explaining, he says like he was young, he was ambitious, and he was careless, and it was his fault, and it's, he's the reason why they died. He does, for to his credit, seem truly contrite that, and you know, it was the mistakes of youth, you know. But he he admits that he is the cause, and that is sort of the connection between Project Daedalus and Michael and the Klingons, and this you know truly is sort of an inciting event for Michael's whole life and the reason she had such a knee-jerk reaction when the Klingons showed up at the beginning of season one. We don't have to go into that. It's a Kupla corner for some day when someone challenges me. But know that I got that one. It's up here. So don't even don't even tell me that the writing, the long-form longitudinal writing on Discovery is not dope. I'm sorry. I almost did it, but I'm not. I'm good. I'm good. Where was I? Right. So Michael's parents... Where that's the reason that they were on Daktari Alpha. That's the reason that the Klingons found them on Daktari Alpha. And that's the reason that they're dead. Leland. Leland's mistakes. And so Michael punches him twice in the nose. <laughs> punches him once. He, he like is knocked back a little bit. And she punches him twice. She says, this one's for my mom. This one's for my dad. He's on the floor with his broken nose bleeding. And Michael says, this isn't over. And then she storms out. Um. She storms out and apparently storms right over to Tyler. And she's like, did you know about this? And Tyler's like, uh, what? Huh? I don't know what you're talking about. And she's like, you, she lays into him. And she's like, the more you hang out with section 31, the more you show people what you really are. And she's basically like, if you want to work for section 31, then we can't even be friends or whatever. Um, and he's gonna, you're going to have to live with the fact that you get your hands dirty with these horrible people who are responsible for the death of my parents. And she storms off from Tyler. Meanwhile, Hugh finally founds, finds Cornwell. Where was she? In her quarters. And basically, he's like, hey, you used to be a psychiatrist. And she goes, I know. And they talk about Hugh's, his relationship to his memories and his past life. Because the memories, he says, are like a dream. It's like someone else's life. And he doesn't feel like uh, he can, it doesn't feel like him. And he needs to find his own space. And uh, Admiral Cornwell is actually very good at sort of like dropping everything she's doing in the middle of this extreme crisis and giving a brief but passionate counsel to uh, a sudden uh, impromptu patient. And they basically end the conversation with, uh, she tells Hugh that love is a choice. And she says, the only way to make a new road is to walk it. Uh, so I guess in that time, Michael has decided now that she stormed off two people and punched a superior officer. Uh, she goes into the like workout gym room and she is just like demolishing some sort of like workout dummy. She's beating it with an inch of his life. Spock arrives and he basically says like, hey, I know you're upset. Uh, you just lost a friend who was killed dramatically. You just found out that you're the Red Angel and you just found out that Leland is responsible for the death of your parents. And so you're kind of going through it. And he says, like, yeah, in my experience, when you experience three, these enormous things that defy logic and explanation, it can leave one feeling slightly disoriented. And for a moment, they sit together and they're finally not snapping at each other. And Michael tells Spock that she thinks he was right, that she's always looking for a way to blame herself because she, she felt that the reason her parents were dead was because of her. And she never even considered there'd be some other outside force. And Spock says, if it'll make your burden any lighter, I accept your apology. Uh, and then they're like, this is a weird conversation. He's like, I wasn't planning to have this conversation when I showed up. What was the conversation supposed to be about? I'll tell you what. Spock understands now, finally, the variance in the red angel showing up. They can't figure out why the signs are where they are. The seven signs are in the sky. There's no way to figure them out. But they have instances where the red angel has shown up without the signs. What were they? Oh, when it showed up to save Michael on the asteroid. Well, you remember when they found um, mm -hmm. Tignataro, who's real, whose yes. name in the show is Jet Reno, when they found Jet Reno. <laughs> it still delights me so much that I just, I'm just like, oh, it's Tignataro. Uh, and also, the Red Angel showed up to, to Spock when he was a child when Michael ran away and was almost killed in uh, the forest in Vulcan. 
And so they go and explain that to uh, Pike and Cornwell. And they basically say like, listen, the red angel shows up whenever Michael is in danger, because if it's Michael in the suit, then it must be going by what Spock calls the grandfather paradox, simply that future Burnham would not exist if present Burnham were to perish. And therefore the red angel must do everything it can in its power to uh, preserve the life of present day Burnham. And so now they know what they have to do. Michael has to be the bait. So the planet they're going to has an unbreathable atmosphere. And so what they want to do is set up everything, set up the phase disruptors, the graviton beam, get ready. And then they're going to put Michael in a chair, strap her down, and then mm. expose her to the environment and let her suffocate to death. And that will force the Red Angel to show up, right? Mm. Pike and Giorgio are both like, are you out of your mind? And for some reason, Spock <laughs> and Michael are like, yeah, no, this is the way it's got to be. It's going to work. It's, it's going to work. It has to really, I have to, basically be on death's door but the red angel cannot not show up so i guess basically they run down this plan and they get approval for it but the way they're going to do it is that like stamets is going to be there to set the disruptors and once they open the the michael up to like the atmosphere she'll basically have two minutes before she suffocates to death and they're going to have culber there hugh ready to uh to break in and revive her in case the red angel doesn't show up and she dies. Right. And, uh, but he's gotta, he's gotta be ready to go through and save her, but not too soon because her death has, her life has to truly be in danger for the red angel to show up. Right. And the, the rest of them will be like, there's like a lab part and there's an outdoor part. So they will be behind a lab where there is actually life support. So right before this mission goes down, Michael goes to see Ash. They have a little apology makeup thing. Um, she didn't want their last conversation to be their last conversation. If you catch my drift, they embrace, they make a little kissy face. Um, lens flare, everyone is happy there. All right. Meanwhile, on the bridge, uh, we welcome Arium's replacement, Lieutenant Nilsson, to the bridge. And it's a bit awkward, but everyone, you know, is like, all right, here you are. Um, so, they're setting up on the planet. Q tries to talk to Paul. Paul's like, now is definitely not the time. It may never be the time. Leland and Tyler are standing by on the Section 31 ship with the graviton things. So Tyler's going to be in charge of, like, getting the graviton beam to make the wormhole collapse, right? And so they're going to have to work quickly because if they don't work quickly, then the AI from the future can use the wormhole to come to the, the present and then reinfect everything. So they're going to have to shut down the wormhole fast. Michael uh, is walked to the chair by Spock and he, they basically strap her in. She says goodbye to Tyler. She asks Spock, what happens, you know, what if it doesn't work? Spock says to her, quote, were you to perish, I would be charged with killing a Starfleet officer again. It would therefore be ideal if you survived. Um, which is like, you know, that's the, that's like Spock giving you a big hug. So Michael is alone in the chamber. They open the roof. She starts to suffocate. Her oxygen levels deplete. The like actual like detritus in the atmosphere atmosphere is like burning her skin. She's screaming and struggling. She starts dying. And actually, the first person to break is surprise, surprise, Philippa Giorgio. Mm-hmm. She's the one that's like, we need to call this off. And she's about to. And then Spock pulls out a phaser and he holds it on Giorgio. And he's like, nope, we got to let this run its course. And then um Hugh is like, no, she's going to die out there. And Spock's like, nope, can't let you out. Got to let it run its course. And everyone's freaking out. And then on the ship, they're sort of like just watching Michael go through like incredible pain and suffocate to death. And Cornwall basically says to Pike, like, it's your call. You're the captain. And Pike tries to call off the mission. And Spock says to him, nope, won't stand down. And so Michael suffocates to death. She dies. And then there is a massive tachyon surge indicative of time travel and a red like the red sign shows up in the sky and the red angel shows up and there's a red alert on the bridge and in section 31 they're trying to the red angel shows up and flies down they're, they got their graviton beam on the wormhole and they're trying to shut down the wormhole but they need more power and so leland's like i'll get you the power and the angel descends and sends a red ray into michael and it causes her to revive and that's when they turn on the disruptors and they attach themselves to the red angel and they're holding the red angel in place and leland goes down to do a retinal scan so that he can 
um, disable the security buffer so they can get more power. And while he's doing that, the computer's like acting a little funny and he's like, oh, come on, it's not so hard. And he's looking through and he gets the retinal scan and then a needle goes into his eye and I assume he dies. But then the very next scene, we hear Leland's voice say, you got it now, Tyler. And so uh, Tyler pumps up the power, wormhole collapses, the uh, the thing, the dome on the thing shuts down. They set up a field around the Red Angel and Michael. Michael is revived. They fire EMPs, which causes the technology of the suit, the like electricity, the electromagnetic technology, technology to stop. Someone falls out of the suit onto the floor and hit him with a dun 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 man. Most important dun 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 of the episode. Yes, it's Michael's mom. <laughs> Do another dun dun dun. Just do another dun dun dun. One more. I threw my papers for that dun dun dun. That that was how important it great. was. That's just great story writing. I didn't think I. No one saw that damn coming. It. Damn it, Discovery! I love you. You did it. Oh boy. Let's set phasers to stats. Set phasers to stats. Listen, let's get the basic stuff out of the way. There was one yellow alert in these two episodes, and there were two red alerts. Red alert. I forgot we had one with <laughs> your father saying red alert. No, no, I, no, I like the one with your dad. <laughs> he also says a very, it's not like red alert. It's like red alert. Hello? You guys there? Uh... We have something far more important to do. Yes, we do. Because you're absolutely right. In these two episodes, in fact, spanning the bridge between the two so elegantly is uh is the death of Lieutenant Commander Aram, and we'd like to uh send her off in style. <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Arium, you once were human. You once were in love. Your fiance died in a fatal uh, crash that nearly took your life. Unfortunately, technology could rebuild you. You were the three million dollar Starfleet officer. You were a best friend to Tilly. You adored her muchly. However, because of your cybernetic or half cybernetic brain, you allowed control to take over you, and it caused you to compromise yourself. And then you, you gave the greatest sacrifice for your team. You had faith of the heart. Uh, yes, we say goodbye to Lieutenant Arium, Lieutenant Commander Arium. Forever. Quotable moments? Quotable moments. Do you know what? I'm just going to use the bloody sound effect. Quotable moments. Well, you listen, you are the sound effect while the sound effect lasts. Okay, I have a couple from episode nine, uh, but the one I really liked was when Spock gets upset. Spock says, I am angry, pure and simple. And Michael interrupts because you feel like you failed as a Vulcan or as a human. And Spock says, what I feel is that failure is liberating. And for the first time, I enjoy expressing emotion. And then he knocks over all the stuff. He breaks all the toys and he goes home. That was beautiful. Do you have any quotes that you enjoyed from... uh... I didn't. I was focusing too much on the episodes, actually. I think there's one of the, what Michael says at Arium's funeral is very sweet. Um, mm. The, I will take the, uh, yeah, I'll just read the first part of it. It's, it's longer. Than, you know what? This, this is my show. It's our show, but you know, I'm going to read the whole thing and I'm sorry. Okay. Go for it. I didn't have to do, do it. All right. <laughs> it's, it's tough stuff. All right. Michael says at Arium's funeral. There are so many reasons to join Starfleet. We get to reach for the stars. We get to reach for the best in ourselves. But most important, we get to reach for each other. We get to do what we love alongside colleagues who become friends, who become family. And who better to stand with, shoulder to shoulder, facing these pivotal moments? Who more painful to let go? pretty good beautiful. beautiful 
I did realize as I was writing it out, I mean, I don't want to be a super nerd about it, but I feel like, I feel like you're supposed to use whom in the last sentence, but I don't know if that's totally correct. Cause it's like, it's cause she doesn't use the preposition. Who is it harder to let go of, you know what I mean? Whom more painful to let go of whom more painful of whom more painful to of whom more painful to let go is how it really should be <laughs> written. But you can see how that really spoils. The you can see, yeah, you, it does totally. <laughs> of whom more painful to let go. Yeah. It's a good thing. I'm not writing dialogue for Star Trek because I would have, I would have derailed this thing. All right. Next time. Next time on set phasers. Next time on Set Phasers, as we come around the bend here, is sort of the home stretch of season two um, and running right into season three for us. We'll be doing episodes uh, episodes 11 and 12 of season two, and they are entitled respectively Perpetual Infinity and this lighthearted title Through the Valley of Shadows. So... Those should be, they're probably just quick romps. Just they're going to rise up, probably go swimming or something. Who doesn't love a quick romp? Who doesn't love a quick romp? This wee tea Jenny does. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Thank you for joining us, dear listeners. If you enjoy the program, you can catch us every Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Facebook Live or every Monday as a podcast, wherever podcasts come from. And and if you are downloading us wherever you get your podcast, please rate and subscribe. It helps people find us. Yes, give us a good review, please. Um, We are on Facebook and Instagram at Set Phasers Podcast. Feel free to follow along and join in the conversation of all things track. And if you want to join us on Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. EST, we are doing a Netflix watch party. So exciting. So exciting. And if you wanted to be part of that Netflix party, all you have to do is sign up to patronize us we can take it <laughs> by going to patreon.com slash set phasers and join uh, up and you can be part of our continuing mission to discover what Discover has in store for us indeed well until next time and possibly Sunday I'm Seth Mans and also possibly until Sunday I'm Aki Burmese and this has been Set Phasers a highly illogical Star Trek podcast computer end program Hmm?